Um, so I'm um, Cesar, Cesar Puerta, uh, and I work at uh, Twitter. And My name is Hans Doctor. Uh, I'm from Gradle and the founder of Gradle. So uh, today we want to talk about uh, optimizing build performance of Android with Android Studio 3.0 and, and the latest uh, version of, the, of Gradle and the Gradle Android plugin. And what I really like with this talk is that it's not like no sample projects, no test projects. It's one of the very important Twitter apps of the world. Uh, so, uh, yeah, what was your experience with that transition? Well, <laughs> builds waste time. Uh, and uh, I think that we will pretty, we, we, we will agree that any time you, that, you're, uh, that you use wasting for, uh, waiting for, for a build, that's waste time. So how bad is it? Um, this is our build at Twitter one year ago. 54 mod modules, one huge module, and a bunch of smaller module, modules. Uh, and these were the dark times of uh, AGP 2.2 and Gradle 3.1. And uh, our times were awful. Um, let's say that we, we have 55 developers uh, and 30 builds per day. That's like way too long. Let's say it's uh, one full day waiting for builds uh, every, single, every single day. So we have a number of challenges that are unique uh, to, to Android. Um, Past iteration, uh, we are shipping a new, a new release every week. We just can't wait. We just, we just can't start, can't stop to, uh, to, to rebuild our build. Um, large, uh, large code base with, uh, with few modules. Annotation processing is pervasive, uh, meaning that code size grows up very quickly. Builds are really complex and hard to understand. Who knows what's going on with those hundreds of tasks that are running, uh, that are running in parallel. Performance bottlenecks and regressions go unnoticed. Sometimes you upgrade to a new version of, uh, of Gradle, a new version of, AG, of AGP, and all of a sudden, uh, your times start creeping up. And you may only realize when it's too late. And we don't really have a huge uh, build team. We actually have uh, one person in a build team that's uh, part-time working on Android, and the rest of it is in the Android team. So we really can't afford to build a lot on top of the on, on top of the, the, the existing tools, and I uh, I imagine that a lot of people out there uh, are probably in a similar situation. So that's where we were. In this presentation, we're going to talk about uh, just uh, some tips for optimizing your builds, uh, how to monitor and understand your builds, uh, how to debug issues, and I think that this is most important. When you run into an issue, how can you use the tools that you have? Uh, in order to debug those problems. And finally, a few tips for optimizing the code base for bit performance. So with that, Hans Excellent. is going to talk about yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the general improvements that have been made, the mechanisms, the tools that have been added, before then Cesar continues with applying that to the Twitter build and, and look at the results. So, uh, when you look at uh, the Gradle build platform, right, uh, uh, independent of the Gradle Android plugin, uh, so, uh, we have improved performance in many areas. It was our main focus, right? Much faster up-to-date checking, faster configuration time, faster startup time. Uh, it's 300 milliseconds, you might have not noticed, but we, we looked at everything, right? And, and faster dependency resolution. So that, that is an interesting one. So build performance and what affects build performance is very sensitive to your build. So faster dependency resolution at Netflix, where they have thousands of different source code repositories and everything is doing binary integration, Dependency resolution was a huge bottleneck. So we brought build times down from 30 minutes to two minutes with faster dependency resolution. For your Android build, right, might be three seconds, right? So, so certain performance capabilities affect the very, very much depend on the environment, how effective they are, how relevant they are for you. So let's focus on what was really important for Android. So uh, uh, if we look, look back, it's a little bit more than a year, right? So uh, in 3.0, the daemon was enabled by default. Uh, 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 and then three four we've introduced compile avoidance, incremental compilation, and for all the build cache, and for the one the worker API. So so let's look at more detail uh, about uh, the effects of those features. So so daemon by default. Uh, so I don't have to ask anymore who's using a daemon. It's now enabled by default. But I think it's still important to understand right what is happening here because uh, I think as you said you don't have. Many, you don't have many people to kind of to build upon a tool chain, but you should understand their behavior. So the Gradle, so when you, when you start Gradle first time, right, Gradle is cold and it fires up uh, a server process, a daemon. And that daemon is not just a warmed up JVM, it stores a lot of state in memory, which will accelerate the execution of subsequent builds. 
So this is, uh, this is actually the build from Twitter. So whenever you see the bird, uh, that means those are numbers from Twitter. And uh, yeah, a clean build, three minutes now. This, this is today. This is with 3.0, right? Without the demon. Uh, and this is with the demon. So uh, it's still significant. Of course, here execution time is dominating. When you have an incremental build, it's uh, twi twice as long without the demon and with the demon. So uh, one thing when someone is complaining to you or the build is slow, have an eye on, is the demon used, right? So, okay. Uh, next very important feature is, uh, uh, it's, it's actually a set of features. Compile avoidance, incremental compilation, Java library plugin. Um, so uh, compile avoidance, uh, what does it do? When with compile avoidance, uh, when you have a module two, it depends on the module one. And uh, you change uh, the implementation of the of a method. So ABI means application binary interface. So so a change that doesn't change the interface of a module, right? With compile avoidance, we still do a recompile of module one, but we detect, hey, this is not relevant for the change for, for recompiling module two, so we don't recompile module two. And you can imagine in a larger dependency graph, that is a, a very effective feature. And uh, it improves compiler performance, and it also improves the cache hit rate. We will talk about that later when we talk about the build cache. So, uh, oops, that's a funny uh, build up. So uh, the other thing we added as part of compile avoidance is the Java library plugin. You might have seen in already in the Android Cradle plugin, 3.0, you can now assign dependencies either to an API configuration or an implementation configuration, right? So what is this about, right? So uh, before, when, you, when you're not using the Java library plugin and your module three has dependencies on module one and module two, when you compile module four, is module one and module two, will it be in your compile class path or not? It will be the whole transitive path is in your compile class path, right? So which uh, is not very effective because when you now change module two, let's say the public signature, it will trigger a recompile of module four. Compile avoidance says, well, this is a sick, a change of the interface, right? So, but when you now tell Gradle, hey, module two is an implementation dependency of module three, it will no longer show up in the compile class part of module four. And uh, in, in reality, you don't have many API dependencies, you mostly have implementation dependencies. So that reduces class path sizes easily by order of magnitude, right? Uh, and uh, yeah, everything, compile performance is much better, much better avoidance, less to check, for compile avoidance, and again, smaller class pass means higher cache hit rate. Okay, so uh, uh, yeah, for Java projects, use the Java library plugin, uh, and then use the API and implementation configurations and declare annotation processors properly in a processor class path. I will, I will refer to some documentation to show you how to do it. And th this is a very powerful feature. Uh, so uh, the other feature, uh, that is complementary to compile avoidance. So, so once Gradle uh, figured out, okay, this was a change of the, of the interface, right? Uh, now we have to recompile. Uh, so what incremental compilation does, uh, uh, whatever you change, it analyzes the whole class dependency graph and decides uh, uh, which classes needs to be recompiled. So even module one is now not fully recompiled, and module two is only in as much recompiled as uh, it is affected by the change in module one. It's a more expensive analysis, right? So that's why compile avoidance comes first, and then comes incremental compile. Uh, so compile avoidance and, and also the cache hit rate, right? Because, uh, uh, so, well, no, this is wrong. It does not affect the cache hit rate. So that, that was a copy and paste error. It improves compiler for performance, not, doesn't improve the caching rate. Uh, so, uh, but there's, there is a gotcha <laughs> at this point. So in Java projects, for compatibility reasons, we will enable it by default in Gradle 5.0. In Gradle 4.x, you still need to explicitly enable it, right? And then it, in Android projects, it's enabled by default. In the presence of annotation processors, it's disabled. Per module. So when you have 45 modules, no, 45 developers, 40, 54 modules. <laughs> uh, so uh, all the modules that use annotation processors will not benefit from these features at this point. Because uh, we don't know enough about the annotation processors to understand how a change is incrementally affecting the output 
of an annotation processor, right? So uh, this is work in progress, right? We will work, we are working right now on a solution to that together with the Google Android team. And uh, th this will be a, a, yeah, very, very beneficial once, once, we, once we have released that. It will be a solution that will be, uh, that will, uh, it will not be generic. Uh, there will be uh, uh, it every annotation processor basically has to has to describe w how its incremental behavior is right uh, we will work for the most popular ones right but there will be an interface so that your custom annotation processors you have some right can also make use of that but you have to do some implementation work if you want to understand uh, uh, this topic in detail Compile avoidance, incremental compilation and the Java library plugin this, there's a really 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 good article about that in depth Right. Uh, so uh, um, one of the very exciting features uh, that came with Gradle 4.0 is the build cache. And uh, so to understand the build cache, let's let's start first in understanding the up-to-date checking in Gradle. You, you all know the up-to-date checking, right? When Gradle says the task is up to date. So oops. So how this works is whenever you you execute uh, a Gradle task. Uh, it stores the hashes for the input and outputs of that task uh, uh, on this. So the next time you run the Gradle build, we calculate the current inputs and output hashes, right? And for the compiler, it means uh, 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 your class path, your sources, your compiler version. And when this is the same, we, the task is considered up to date and not executed, right? So, uh, and uh, one thing we also do with that feature, if a task is incremental, we tell the task, hey, those are the input files that have been removed to avoid stale output. Those are the input files that have changed so that you can easily now write an incremental task. In any case, uh, what the up-to-date checking is offering you is, uh, is uh, it reuses build output from the last time you run this build on your machine. And we have now added another layer on the, cache, on, on, on the reusability of output, which is called the build cache, where, first of all, it's not just from last time, from any time you have built, right, you can use the output, and not just on this machine, but from anywhere. You can now share build output. And that is a, a very important uh, performance accelerator. So how does it work? When Gradle considers a task uh, out of date, it uses the same input and output information to calculate a key out of the input. Uh, and, and then it asks the build cache, do you have output for that input, right? And uh, uh, if not, it will execute the task other, uh, and stores the output in the cache, and otherwise it will retrieve the output from the cache. So a typical setup is uh, that you uh, Gradle comes out of the box with a local cache, uh, and usually the local cache, uh, uh, or not usually, the local cache is very helpful when you switch between branches, right, for your dirty working copies, right. Uh, uh, the remote cache, usually developers don't write to it, they only read from it, and CI, where you have a more controlled environment, writes to the, to the remote cache. And that is a, a, a very effective feature to accelerate CI builds as well as developer builds. You need to enable it, right? At a future version in Gradle, it will be enabled by default, but uh, uh, at the moment you need to enable it, right? And, and it's, it's, it's very configurable. So, uh, um, a couple of more things about the build cache. Uh, so, any of your custom tasks, you can use the cache API, they are cacheable. Java, Groovy, Scala, two chains are cacheable. Android is in 3.0 cacheable, but there are some issues, so you need to apply some workarounds. You will talk about that. We expect those workarounds to go away with the 3.1 release. Uh, who was at KotlinConf? Great show, huh? So, uh, if, yeah, you might have seen, you might have heard already about that. Uh, uh, we expect uh, cacheability for Kotlin uh, very soon. Right, uh, uh, the Kotlin team is maintaining the Gradle Kotlin plugin, and we're working together on that. So uh, stay tuned. If you want to understand uh, uh, more about the input-output modeling, Gradle up-to-date checking, and the build cache, uh, this is an excellent guide to to read. So, and here are some numbers, right, for Twitter by, by using the build cache. So this is a clean build uh, uh, with uh, no cache and with the cache. We can make, this is, this is an amazing improvement, but this will get better even over time, right? And of course, for the incremental scenario, right, when you change one line of code, the build cache is not helping you. 
Okay, so last thing uh, 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 of the new features is uh, coarse grain parallel execution. Uh, so uh, use, who of you is using dash dash parallel when, when building Gradle? Uh, so it's the, check this out, right? It's, it's project level parallelism, it's usable with Kotlin. Uh, it, it, it has a strong effect on your build time, especially with Android Gradle plugin 3.0. The parallelization efficiency has been much improved, right? So uh, one problem with that is, and that is why it's not enabled by default, you can do some stuff, right? That uh, if you don't configure your Gradle build correctly, we will, the way parallelism works, uh, with dash dash parallel, it's hard for us to detect, so you, so you have to pay attention to that. Uh, what we have introduced in Gradle 4.1 is the new worker API, right? And that enables uh, uh, immutable, very guaranteed, uh, 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 so a safe, guaranteed, uh, reliable parallelism, uh, and a much more fine-grained parallelism, right? So you can use that uh, for subtask parallelism uh, or for intratask parallelism. Uh, so uh, it's enabled by default, so you can use it for all your custom tasks. Uh, it's used partially at this point in Android, Android Gradle plugin 3.0. Uh, the Gradle core plugins starting to use it, and the Gradle, Kotlin Gradle plugin is also starting to use it. So out of the box, you're not getting many benefits from that, but, it's, uh, but there's now much better infrastructure there, and over time, this will be used much, much more uh, by all the, the standard plugins that you are using. Okay. The Android Gradle plugin 3.0, uh, there are excellent presentations, right, uh, uh, about all the work that went into that. It's an amazing job, the Google Android team there, right? Much faster configuration time on the, on the Android specific configuration aspects, many memory and speed improvements, better incrementalism, better parallelism. Uh, if you want to learn more, more about that, uh, this is a, a, from, from Xavier, the presentation, no, this one, the Gradle Summit, and this is from James at, at, at Google I.O. Okay. So yeah, so until now we've uh, we've been looking at uh, the builds, uh, the build tools that you're getting out of the box. Um, now, for the next uh, section, we are going to look at uh, how to understand your builds and what tools do you have for understanding your builds. And it's there's going to be a quick overview uh, of the tools that you have for monitoring your builds before moving on to talking about how you apply them uh, in in practice to to figure out your own build issues. Cool. So. So one thing you can do, you can run Gradle with dash dash profile. Who knows about that? Dash dash profile. Right, so it's pretty, uh, it generates a report and build reports profile, uh, list timing for configuration task execution. Right, so it looks like this. Uh, get a summary, right, where the time was spent. Uh, uh, you see which tasks were up to date, how long they took. You didn't have a designer at this time, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, but there's now a much better way uh, uh, to to see what's going on with your build, uh, and that feature is called build scans. So uh, you can run starting with Gradle 4.3. You don't need to configure anything. Before that, you need to apply the build scan plugin with 4.3 that is built in. You can run any Gradle build with dash dash scan, and then uh, depending on your setup, it will either send a, bu a build scan to the Gradle cloud services. It's a, it's a free service, right? Uh, you need to agree right, that, that we upload that, or like Twitter, you have an on-premises version of Gradle Enterprise where you, where you publish it to, to a Gradle Enterprise server. And uh, let's talk about uh, a build scan that you can upload to, uh, uh, to the Gradle Cloud services. So this is what, when you run a Gradle build, you get a URL at the end of the build. You can click this URL and you get to this view, right? And yeah, design has improved. <laughs> and uh, <Yes. laughs> and uh, um, you get tons of valuable information that, help, that helps you to optimize the build, but also to detect uh, problems uh, why your test might have been failing, right? So from a developer perspective. Uh, so you have a timeline view, right? You can understand the parallelism, right? And obviously we see some potential for improvement here, right? Uh, and you get, have a lot of querying uh, opportunities, right? You can filter all the tasks by certain criteria. Uh, uh, of course, performance is a very important aspect of build scans, right? How effective are tasks avoided uh, uh, and, and which tasks are uh, spending most of the build, using most of the build time. Uh, and, and it's by design a deep collaboration tool. So for example, uh, 
if, you, if you're wondering what is your dependency situation, might a dependency be responsible for a, prop, for a failure that you're having, right? You can, you can dive deep into, uh, into the dependency graph. And for, for all the views you have, have here, there, there, are, there, are, uh, uh, there are deep links, right? That you can send to someone and the person will get exactly the same view. Uh, so it's a very helpful collaboration tool. Uh, and you can extend it, right? So uh, you can add your own tags, you can add your own custom links, for example, a link to a, to a diff that, that, that captures what, what has changed to the, in, a, in, a, in, your, in your dirty working copy compared to the last commit. So, so you can provide a lot of context for someone to analyze what is going on. Uh, when task has failed, right, you get the whole context of the task failure. And uh, let's talk quickly about Cradle Enterprise. That is a version you can install on premises soon. There will be also hosted instances of Cradle Enterprise. And, and here you have access to all the data, right? So, uh, uh, so you have a search view. You can say, hey, show me all the CI builds that have failed uh, and, and, and much more. Uh, you can do build comparison. Why did it? And you will show that later. Why did it succeed locally and failed on CI? Uh, and you can use the export API. So this is an example. Tableau is using Gradle Enterprise and it did some amazing analytics, right? Uh, uh, with the export API, pumping the data into Tableau, uh, the big rectangles are compile tasks and test tasks, for example, right? Uh, and the bigger they are, the more failures they have. And then the, the, the inner rectangles are, is a specific compile task of a specific project. So you get a really good idea where are the bottlenecks. Uh, and Gradle Enterprise also ships with a, a remote cache backend, right? Uh, 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 Multi-node uh, replication will be available soon. So uh, yeah. And, uh, and one thing you would do with Gradle Enterprise, you would enable publish always, that you, that you really collect all the data, every execution, every Android Studio, Gradle execution, command line execution, CI execution, you will collect all the data. So you have a really good idea about the uh, uh, build experience all your developers have, wherever they are. Okay, so now we're getting into even deeper territory. Yep. Oh. Yeah, I'm going to be yeah. talking about, first about a couple of uh, lower, uh, lower level tools, uh, like the Gradle Profiler. So the Gradle Profiler is this uh, open source command line tool that you can use for run, uh, running your builds. And what the Profiler will do is it will, uh, it will run your build, um, this, is, this is a command line, it will run your build and it will give you a Chrome trace, for example, um, of, uh, of your builds, uh, which you can just configure like this. So you would say, this is my project, uh, and this is the scenario that I want to run. I want to, I want to profile a non-ABI uh, ABI change to see how, how, it, how fast it is. So this is what, uh, this is what a, a scenario looks like. So you would say this is a task. Uh, this, is, this is the file that I want to change uh, in order to emulate a change in that particular file. These are just a couple of configuration arguments. And these are a number of warm-ups. As we mentioned earlier, the daemon makes a huge difference. So the profiler uh, will warm up the build before it starts taking measurements. Um, and this is what you get. So if you're familiar with this trace, uh, you, will, uh, this, uh, you will find this very familiar. Uh, you're getting here uh, the CPU occupation, and this is the, this is the heap. And this is the, these are all of the threads and all of the tasks that are running on each one of them. And you can see for each, uh, each one of those uh, what, what sub-operations they were running. So this is giving you a lot, uh, a lot of detail. Uh, in some cases, it will not be enough. So what's happening, that long task down there, what's taking most of the time there. And in that case, you will want to use uh, just a regular profiler like your kit, for example. So your kit, uh, you see, it gives you a lot of detail here. For example, it's showing you uh, that uh, Dagger is running, so you can see how long uh, of your compilation time is taken by annotation processors. You can see some more detail here, like the, the, the actual the distribution of, uh, of uh, operations to, to different threads. And setting it up, setting it up uh, is relatively straightforward. So you can just go to your greater properties and add to the JVM uh, properties of your, of your daemon this, uh, this this, this line is saying, I want you to load um, uh, your kit as soon as the, as the build starts. And you would say, I want to do a sampling profile and I want to save a snapshot uh, of memory at the end of it. And that's it. Uh, that, will, uh, that will give you, the, that, that will give you the, uh, the snapshot. An option is to use the profiler uh, instead. Uh, so this is a super convenient way to get a profile of your build. It will run 
uh, your, your full build using that scenario, uh, and it will produce a snapshot at the end. One last tool that you have is to use the logs. Now, ideally, you don't want to do that, right, since uh, logs are incredibly verbose, and uh, I've seen that there are a number of other things. But if you wanted to know, for example, uh, what uh, parameters are you passing into the compiler, right? Well, the logs would give you just that. Uh, you, can, you can look at the info logs, and you would see that uh, the boot class path, the processor class path, there's a ton of other information. But this is, in particular, uh, one very useful piece of information that you will not find uh, anywhere else. And these are the tools uh, that we have. Now, in practice, uh, this you may find uh, your own your own issues, uh, and you you need to you need to figure out how to use this, how to use these tools in order to address them. So, this is what the next this next section uh, is about. We're going to look at a number of issues that we've been running into at Twitter as part of our working optimizing the build, and walk through uh, how we have uh, we have used these tools to uh, to solve them in the hopes that it could be useful to you. So a very typical issue is up-to-date check issues, or these days, I guess, that we would say caching issues. Since uh, the problem here is that you run a build, you run the very same build a second time, and you, can, uh, and you get a rebuild. Why is that happening? Or uh, you run a build in one machine, and then you run a build in another machine, and you get a number of, uh, a number of tasks that are rerunning, even though they were cacheable. Well, if they're cacheable, you would expect that every single one of those tasks would be reduced, right? So how, how would you figure out uh, why is this task running and nothing changed? Well, there's logs. <laughs> and you can, you, can look at, you can look at the output of this, of this task, and that would tell you what properties changed. I mean, no one does that. Um, the most convenient tool that you have is build scans. It doesn't have to be great in enterprise, uh, but you can use, you can use um, build scans if you want to, to find, for example, in this case, tasks that were successful uh, in spite of being cacheable, meaning these are tasks that run uh, even if uh, they, should be, they should be in cache. You can go into any one of, the, of those tasks and you can look at the properties that changed. Like this is when this, this, one, this is telling you that the compiler arcs changed. So now you can go to the logs, as, as I mentioned earlier, and you can see what's, what's changing between the compiler arcs. Or um, you may get this other option. Well, this is not really saying anything. This is saying, this is saying a bunch of directories were deleted. Uh, well, uh, yeah, the build, uh, this was a clean build, so of course I know that. Um, that if you wanted uh, to know in every single case the reason why, uh, why a task was rebuilt, what you would want to do is do a, uh, in Gradle Enterprise, you would do a, a build comparison. And that will, uh, you can pick two builds. You can pick, uh, pick the original build and the build that should be getting everything from the cache. And you can compare those builds and that will tell you that the source changed. Um, the source of the compiler arguments. So this is, the, this is the fastest way to figure out those issues. In the past, uh, it was almost impossible. I mean, it was not worth the effort trying to figure out these issues, but now it's very easy and uh, it, uh, it really pays off uh, to spend some time trying to understand if you have any one of these issues. Now, I'm going to show you a bunch of issues, uh, typical issues that you may run into, so that you see that this is actually something that happens every day, and this is not something that the tools will necessarily solve for you. Uh, Indeterministic code generation, this is a very typical one. So you may have something like this. This is the build, the, the build config. And the release time uh, in it, that's changing every, sing every single time. That's making, that's, that's making your application potentially non-cacheable, which uh, is a huge waste of time. Another typical issue is you may, be, you may be writing your own annotation processors, and you may not realize that some of your code uh, is non-deterministic. You, you have a list of things that depends on the order in which you're loading them from disk, and now it turns out that these files are different every time that you build, uh, that, that you do a new build. Um, another potential issue that's similar uh, is non-relocatable uh, artifacts. This is, uh, you build something in this, uh, in this computer, and then you would expect it to be available in this other computer that has different absolute paths for, for, for files, and it doesn't work. That may be because you have absolute paths as part, of, as part of your build, which happens also more frequently than you would think. Here's in this example, you would see the comparison says the, compilers, the compiler arcs are different. Now you look at the arcs, well, yeah, it turns out that we are passing uh, a, an absolute path to an output file into our, into our annotation processor. That's breaking incremental, uh, it's breaking the um, uh, caching for that artifact as well. So uh, sure enough, that's the code. Um, you can 
replace it, something like this. That's a utility function that we wrote, but uh, you get the you get the idea, uh, and that would fix it. Similar problem, uh, AIDL generation. It's embedding the the absolute path of the original files uh, in the in the generated files, which is well, I guess it made sense, but not anymore. If you're using and you're using caches, so that's another bug, and I'm hoping that uh, uh, Google will fix soon. Other issue that may go unnoticed is empty directories. An empty directory is actually a file uh, in your input. So if you have an empty directory that may have been left behind uh, by, by, by Git uh, in when, as you delete files, uh, you may find, well, the exact same problem, that your source is different. Now, if you were to compare the, um, uh, the, two, uh, the two trees, you may find that that's the only, the only thing. And Grader will take care of this at some point, but for now, you should know that empty directories uh, will cause this problem. And finally, you may have corrupt or invalid artifacts in your, in your cache, meaning that uh, your, build is, uh, your build is failing uh, when you're building it from the, from the, from the cache, otherwise it's, it's working well. So, um, in order to figure out what's going on, you may use this, this nice feature in, in Grader Enterprise that uh, will allow you to go from any uh, from any cached, uh, any cached uh, 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 task to uh, whichever other task that produced that, uh, that, that file. So that will help you figure out what was the build that produced this, uh, this, this, this artifact that's not what I was expecting. And then, I guess that you could do this, right? Just get rid of the cache and be done with it. But that's not a great idea because, um, well, uh, if this artifact is in the remote cache, the problem is certainly not going away. But there are a number of other things that you can do. Uh, you can certainly run without the build cache, uh, or uh, you, can, you can fix the issue in the task that's producing the artifact, which will invalidate the existing artifact since the cache key will change when you make these changes, and that, uh, with that the problem will be gone. And in the case that the task uh, is not something that you belong, that, that you own, that you cannot change it. Uh, then what you can do is just disable the caching for the task, which you can do just with this simple snippet, and just for every task of that type within your project, uh, you will disable the cache. And uh, that's it. Um, finally, um, Hans just mentioned that there are a number of bugs in 3.1 uh, in 3.0, sorry, uh, that uh, that are preventing, that are sort of breaking remote uh, remote cache in a number of ways. It's actually significant. Uh, if you were to fix all of those uh, all of those bugs, you, know, you you get a significant improvement. Uh, Grader collected fixes for all of them while uh, 3.1 uh, ships, and uh, well, you can enable like this. Uh, there is uh, this, this this plugin that you can apply uh, to your to your Android projects will fix all those bugs. Um, in our particular case, uh, just apply, applying that uh, increased our, uh, our hit rate in the remote cache from 70% to 80%, which is pretty good. So, other type of issue, memory issues. Uh, and this happens all the time. Your build is super slow, and it may just be that you're, uh, that, uh, you're spending a large part of your time in garbage collection, right? So, you would see it in the profiler like this. Uh, it would tell you that's garbage collection, and it would say, hey, you're spending most of your time in garbage collection. Or you can go, uh, you, know, you can look at the scan, and the performance output, you can see that's 35 seconds uh, in garbage collection, which is quite a lot. Um, so there are a number of things that you can do uh, in this, uh, for this problem. You could potentially uh, increase the heap size. Uh, but this is not going to solve every problem. Uh, if uh, there is a lot of garbage collection, uh, increasing the heap size may potentially just uh, increase the duration of the pauses. But overall, the time that you spend in garbage collection may end up being exactly the same. So an alternative uh, is to fork uh, compilation, um, since uh, that's one of the greediest tasks and that you that you have. Uh, so this this may be another option. The process, the compilation process, will be torn down altogether. Uh, and it, actually, uh, Gradle, is, uh, Gradle is using a separate, a, a separate process that stays alive for the duration of the build. Uh, so it will, uh, it will start all of the builds in the separate process, uh, process, but at the end of the build, it will tear it down. And finally, if you have a leak, um, you, can use, uh, you can use your kit, uh, for example, to, to find it. So you're, as, like I mentioned earlier, you would, uh, you would set up the, the daemon uh, to, to run uh, your kit and to collect a memory snapshot at the end of the build. Um, and this is, 
and this is what you get. Um, you would get, uh, you, you would get, um, uh, you can look at the snapshots and you can go to object dominators. An object dominator in your kit uh, is an object that's solely responsible for retention of a large amount of um, memory, uh, of objects in, me in memory. So in this particular build, uh, you, ca you can see that the, um, the merge resources task, and this is taken from an alpha, an early alpha of 3.0, this is fixed now. <laughs> but um, the merge resources task uh, would be holding uh, one gigabyte and a half at the end of the, at the, end of the build. Um, just and drilling into uh, those those tasks, you can see uh, that uh, the inputs, the resources were loaded into memory and kept in memory until the end until the end of the build. So this is this 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 can happen. Typically, you don't, you don't have to fix Google's bugs; they will figure them out. But I mean, it's good to have the tools, and uh, you may find uh, you may run into similar uh, into similar similar bugs. And also, well, uh, if you do find uh, bugs in the um, in the Gradle tools, you may as well report them. <laughs> Uh, and they do a pretty good job at, uh, at uh, responding, so you should really do that. The slow execution times, uh, that's, that's a, uh, a similar problem in the sense that your build is doing, is, is doing something, uh, it's, it's taking too long to run your tasks. It may be memory, like I mentioned earlier, or maybe something else. Um, we are using, for identifying regression, which is the, which is the first step, uh, we are using um, the export API in Gradle in grade Enterprise, uh, which allows us to and dump uh, all of the data for each particular task into uh, into a MySQL uh, MySQL database that we can then uh, uh, look up using using Zeppelin. So we are using software that's uh, that's available uh, that's available freely. Here you can see. I mean, these are a lot of lines, right? But in that particular point, that's the average duration of the length task that at the time when we deployed Beta Five shot up. Uh, by uh, around uh, around two minutes, and this is because there is a bug in that part, in that particular beta that will uh, generate an APK at the time of running uh, running lint. That will get fixed soon. But I guess that uh, what's what's meaningful here is that uh, we could uh, we we could detect we could pinpoint where this happened uh, happened very quickly by looking at this. So you can now um, in other in other cases uh, you can you can use the profiler again. Here is a good example of a huge uh, duration for the configuration um, that we can't explain. Uh, you can go into your kit, similarly as we, did, as we did earlier, and you may see in our case here that this particular textile task was taking, was taking forever. Anyway, moving on. Um, moving to the thing that we are, we are running short of time, so uh, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to race through the last couple of sections. Debugging Gradle, this is the last, the last resort. You may want to attach to Gradle, to attach to the AGP, and actually figure out what's, what's going on. Now, that's actually quite straightforward. In the case of Gradle, you can just clone Gradle, start, uh, start Intel IntelliJ, just like this, then run Gradle in debug, in debug mode, uh, and attach to it. Uh, and that's, uh, and that's as, easy, as easy as it, as it gets. Um, using a remote configuration, as you would typically do with a unit test, for example. Debugging the daemon, you may want to do, if you wanted to debug a behavior that's only happening during, let's say, the sync time in Android, in Android Studio. So you can do that as well. You can just uh, update your, your global configuration for the daemon and say, I want the daemon to, uh, to listen for a uh, debugging request. And then you can just uh, run, uh, run your build and attach to it from Android Studio. If what you want to do is debug AGP, and when I say AGP, you may want to debug any tasks in the Android plugin, or you may want to debug your lint rules or your check style rules or anything that's running inside of um, uh, inside of your build. Um, you would you would do the exact same thing. You would start Gradle in debug mode, and you would attach to it in Android Studio in this in this case. And this is as easy as it gets. Uh, as it turns out, Android Studio. Is uh, uh, knows uh, knows the, the version of AGP that you're using. It can fetch the code. Uh, it will automatically allow you to allow you to attach. So it's it's extremely easy. In the past, uh, when I ran into issues with Lint, uh, and sometimes those those can be infuriating to debug, uh, I would just do this. I would figure out the exact issue and I would report it along with a screenshot uh, of the of the debugger at the point of the problem. And that uh, that gives gives you a a, a, a fix uh, much quicker than anything. 
Finally, you may want to patch AGP if you want to, uh, if you want to try something. And uh, this, this can get tricky. <laughs> you wouldn't want to, to, to build all of AGP. So there are uh, alternatives. And as it turns out, uh, Gradle has this thing, has the, has the build source directory, which uh, will compile anything that you, that you put in there and will put it ahead of anything else uh, in the class path when running, uh, when, when running Gradle. So if you were to copy uh, any, any classes from AGP into, into, into build source, uh, into your local build source directory, uh, and put them in there, you can make any changes that you want, and you will see them in the output. So this is, uh, it's as simple as it gets to, to, to patch bugs or to, or to patch issues in, in AGP and try out those fixes. Finally, please do report the bug. Um, finally, the one last thing that we all run into is uh, low parallelism. And it looks like this. Um, you have four workers uh, and, you're, uh, and you're, you're, using, you're using two. Or uh, in, in a build scan, you would see a similar thing. This is depressing. Uh, but it's a typical build. Like, you have a lot of small modules, and then you have these large modules sitting at the top that uh, that's taking a majority of the time. In order to fix that, well, there's not much that the tools can do. So you have to modularize. And it so happens that there is a talk right, out, right after in this room uh, on, this, on this same topic. So it will improve compiler performance, uh, uh, compiler avoidance. It will optimize caching of build artifacts. Uh, it will... Uh, it will optimize uh, parallelization, better code architecture, lots of reasons. Um, for some advice, uh, I could say, uh, so you would want to use API dependencies uh, sparingly, of course. Uh, isolate annotation processing. Uh, Hans mentioned earlier that annotation, annotation processing disables uh, incremental compilation. That has a huge cost. So if you can, if you can move uh, annotation processing outside uh, of your uh, of, your, uh, of your main modules into smaller modules, you can save a lot of time. Remove bottlenecks in your graph. You don't want to have one single task uh, on which uh, one single module on which every single other module depends, right? Uh, use Java modules when possible, since they are simpler. And finally, uh, well, yeah, make users refactors and understand the resources. There are a ton of other things that you can do. You can do dependency injection, you can do dependency inversion, and there are many, many other things, so like I said, uh, someone else will talk about it later today. Um, wrapping up. Um, well, this is where we are now. Uh, we went from 54 modules to 115 modules. Um, still one large module, and we are uh, now in the latest versions of both AGP and Gradle. And this is what, uh, what our build uh, looked like uh, in uh, in June, this is June versus last uh, last year. So, uh, clean builds uh, they went from five minutes to two minutes and a half. Incremental builds went down to thirteen seconds, and this is for building the APK uh, with a fully formed team on. But still, it, it's it, it's it's quite impressive. Um, the latest version we regressed, and this is because uh, we enabled uh, Java eight and the sugar that the sugar task is not incremental. Uh, so that's throwing a wrench in the whole thing. It's still pretty fast, uh, but that's, uh, that's uh, a work in progress. Uh, still, if we add uh, the build cache to it, uh, our, uh, our build times, uh, they're quite, quite impressive. They're much faster than they used to be. So, yeah, there's still work to do, right? Still work Hans? to do, absolutely. So on your side, on our side. So uh, <clears throat> as I mentioned, uh, one thing we're working on intensely is incremental compilation with annotation processors. So that would be a yeah. very impactful feature and stay tuned, right? So uh, um, faster incremental builds, well, it's in this case, it's mostly that regression, right? But in general, there is more incrementalism. For example, check style is not incremental yet. So there are quite a few tasks, you know, where you can step by step improve the incrementalness. Uh, and that will particularly help organizations with uh, uh, larger modules. Uh, Higher parallelism, as you said, modularization is key, but at the same time, uh, even though for the example you showed, we will not get to 100% uh, utilization, we might, uh, with, with more fine-grained parallelism, we might get it up 10, 20% to what it's now, which is nice, right? So uh, memory uh, usage has much improved, but 
34 seconds garbage collection time is not where we want to <laughs> let it end, right? So, uh, yeah, we constantly improve build scans and Gradle Enterprise. So uh, uh, we will also add more and more strict notes to the Gradle input and output model that we will try to avoid as many pitfall, pitfalls as possible, right, uh, that, that you have described. Uh, uh, higher build cache hit rates. Um, hmm. How would we get there? Uh, in terms of on the on the Gradle Android uh, tooling side, well, yeah, of course, some yeah. tasks are not cacheable yet. Uh, uh, that will be cacheable in the future, right? For example, the uh, the transform the Dex transform task is not cacheable yet for various reasons, right? Uh, uh, reliability comes first. We need to invest a little bit more work, and then the cache effectiveness will will probably significantly increase just by that one task. Right. Uh, and then uh, who, yeah. Who suffers from, uh, who, who is really kind of suffering from Android Studio sync times? That's only 10, 10%. So the rest <laughs> is happy with Android Studio sync time. Oh, no, I mean, I mean seriously. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, the thing is, right, we're talking here about the 115 submodule builds, but there are many Android projects that have. It, it is painful. You know, it is yeah. Painful. No, I, but it depends on the size. So, anyhow, it's a big, it's a big focus, right? So that is another area where you can expect a, 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 a progress soon, right? Some stuff is already in master, but it needs to be merged. So, uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. We're much better than we were, but uh, yeah, we will get better. So, oh. uh, yeah, if you have any questions, that's all for us. Yeah, so the question is, are there guidelines how large a module should be? Because We've seen build where, where there's one source class in one module, right? And yeah. that's, I think, not the way to go, I suppose. Not for Twitter, yeah. at least. Yeah, no. I think that uh, we are looking, to, we're looking into, the, in, into different um, criteria for how we break down our modules. I would say that uh, you would want to break them down uh, functionally, uh, typically, or uh, by, by, by layer. I think that what we typically do is grow our modules uh, as uh, as we as, as we add more functionality to them, uh, and then as we find that the, that they become a bit too large uh, beyond, let's say, 200 classes or something like that, we look for opportunities to break them down any further. You probably don't want to to, to, to go uh, to, to go from the very beginning uh, into writing uh, lots of many uh, very small modules, since that's going to be very hard to manage, right? You just need to do that incrementally. This is not this is not something that you can do in a big bank. Uh, you will break things off incrementally. It will naturally uh, grow as you go. Thank you very much. <laughs> <Scratch your thing. laughs>